fun. Oh my gosh, it is. It's time. It is six o'clock here on the Eastern Seaboard, and I am thrilled to be able to welcome all of you to another I Love Tools. I was just saying to our panel of experts how the first one was teaching online. It started with a basic I Love Tools, and it was almost 11 years ago. That's insane, I think. Um, and we're still finding more tools and um, loving to share. So thank all of you for coming on. I am so excited. Tonight we have, um, hopefully if Sean comes on, Sean Hamilton is gonna show us all how to do some great photography with your um, iPhone. So great. We'll maybe just skip over a presentation. We have people on from around the world. So I'm thinking that there's a uh, time zone um, issue there for her, or who knows, maybe her Wi-Fi went down, but we'll figure it out. Um, then we have Heidi coming on, who's on from Australia. She's gonna show you these really pretty clays that are metallic. I'm just like in love with them. She has a class coming up too that you can learn all about it. Ms. Mags is back on. She's gonna show you her favorite polishing tool. So you'll learn how to do some great polishing. Uh, and we love when other people work through the problems for us and then shares it with us. We have Mr. Jeff Kaplan coming on who is a sponsor tonight and he's gonna tell you all about your must have glasses, the craft optics, because we all need to see better and closer. That's all I'm saying. You'll love these, I'm a user. Uh, Ms. Pam East is showing her favorite um, enameling tool. And I'm just gonna be totally transparent. I know right there you're looking at the little artwork and a few things are spelled wrong. I had a rough time this past month putting everything together. So <laughs> I understand it's metallic polyurclaves and enamel. <laughs> I apologize, that will be fixed. That makes me crazy. And then the guru of texture plates, Miss Cindy Pope is back showing us how she makes all her, um, some fantastic texturing tools that you can use for all of your stuff. It's all fun. And then at the end, I brought on Ms. Barbara Becker Simon, who has classes on Craftcast. We love her classes, but she is showing tonight. She's our guest artist. Oh my gosh, you're gonna love what she's making and selling. Um, they're just fantastic. So I'm very excited. Um, oh, someone, Susan just said you have the craft optic glasses and they are great, right? Yeah, Thanks, we Susan. don't do anything on here that isn't great. I'm just saying everything here has been tested, tried and approved by us, which you know, that's not an easy group to get through. So we're thrilled. Um, now, let me just go a little bit forward on this video. I wanna show you a few things while people are still popping on. Here's the new website that you all saw. Um, and if you haven't logged on, I'm sure you already have because you got your um, link to come on tonight. <laughs> You made a new password. It's all for security reasons, but we're really excited about the whole fresh new look here at craftcast.com. You have um, live things coming up. We have like so many fun live webinars coming up now through the end of the year. Check everything out. Um, great, great classes. There's so much fun, you'll love them. Uh, as well as all our video tutorials that are always up there. That's some more of the live classes coming up. But we have the tons, there's hundreds of video tutorials. Um, that one on the uh, right, right there, I just finished making a bunch of the metal clay shell pendants. Those are so much fun to make, just saying. And I was able to do it, so <laughs> it means anyone can do it. Um, really, really fun to make. And then of course, we always like to, um, uh, give everyone a coupon code. So tools 2022 will give you 25% off tonight um, when you uh, order your classes. And it's good through, I think it's November 6. Um, it's written on the, um, in the handout. Now, let me put in here one more time. The handout um, has, you'll want it. It has tons of um, the links for tonight and everything. Um, or Misty, why don't you put the handout in? Oh, you just did, I just saw. I think we have to keep putting it in there because what I've learned is that if you log on after we've put the handout in the box, you won't see it, which makes sense. So we'll keep popping it in there. You can download it in there. That being said, you can also, um, by tomorrow, the video for um, uh, this presentation will be in your Craftcast My Library, as well as the handout, and we'll send you an email telling all of that to you again, so not to worry. Um, I know everyone likes to um, 
watch the um, video afterwards to follow along. A quick, I'm going to ask you all a quick question. Do you all still enjoy having a smaller file to download and watch offline? You can just put yes in there if you still like that. Yes, okay. I just thought so, yes, okay. Yeah, I thought so too, because that way, if you're not someplace, okay, I see all the yeses. All right, thank you, ladies. Yeah, it helps. It's a smaller file, but then you don't have to worry about having Wi-Fi if you want to um, uh, watch it someplace or a connection. You can just go online. All right, so good. We'll keep doing that. Um, we love hearing from all of you and letting us know what's going on and what you've made. Send us all your pictures. It's very exciting. Uh, all right, so now let me just skip ahead. Let me see. Is Sean here? No. Okay, we are officially worried about her, but we hope she comes on before the end. We'll see if she comes on. Um, let me skip ahead to um, Heidi. You're going to be next. All right. Let me pull up your, let me just skip ahead a little bit. Um, she has a great presentation on using your iPhone, but and I've watched it and I love it, but I'm not going to pretend to know it enough by heart that way. So Sean will be back on and she'll show us everything. But now what we're going to see are these, did I spell it right here? Motel? No, they're still wrong. There. Um, so we'll just won't pay attention to that right now. Uh, but these great metallic clays um, and Heidi is a wonderful uh, polymer clay teacher. We love her classes. She has a great class coming up. You'll see a picture of that at the end. But Heidi, walk us through these beautiful clays. Okay, um, so look, <laughs> yeah, I'm here to talk through um, one of my favorite clay brands, which is Cernet. It's a European brand, but within the extensive range of Cernet, um, I'm going to talk about the uh, metallic range, but you can <coughs> see there just how many there are number one, opaline, there's even a neon range, nature, pearl, and then the metallic range. So looking at that metallic range, there's 21 colors, 21 colors within that range. And let's see how many I've got. Oh, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've got 11 colors, which isn't even half the range. But just looking at the colors, like what a range there is even in that small number. Um, there's a few, there's a few good primary colors within there. There's the yellow, there's the red and the blue, which are quite primary. And then in between, there are some lovely secondary colors and even sort of in between those secondary colors are some more subtle, beautiful kind of mid-toned greens, et cetera. It's just, I mean, that 11 range, that does me pretty well for all the work I like to do. They're so, gorgeous. I have them in okay. person. They're very seductive. Very. <laughs> yeah, I've been just looking at the packages, enjoying and thinking. So don't laugh, it's... Max. <laughs> <laughs> so um, looking at the um, so conditioning polymer clay across the board, not even metallics is really important. Looking at this piece of clay, you can see that it's not kind of shimmery and sparkly across the whole piece. So what you're needing to do with metallic clay in particular is make sure all those mica particles are sitting flat and sort of all facing the same way. So you can see on that piece, everything's smooth. There's no um, breaks in that shiny, shiny surface. Hmm. So, and I find these clays, the, con the consistency of them is really lovely and easy to work with. And so here are some pieces that I've made. I tend to use the clay straight from the packet. I don't do a whole lot of mixing. Um, that pendant showed a few little teeny tiny pieces. This also shows um, some sliced pieces of mokume. So that piece on the left and that piece on the right is actually a scrap, which is super fun to use that. This is also uh, an earring from a slab, not using quite as many colors, but still, and I love that it's a subtle metallic. I'm not a sparkly glitter girl, but I do love the subtle metallic look. So, I yeah, mean, that's actually love scrap. it. <laughs> I, let me, t I just want to say, I, because Heidi's class is coming up, we've already done the videos and her bonus alone is worth the price of the class because what she does with scrap and making tube beads, I was enthralled is all I'm going to say. So that's lovely. And that's how many colors would you say is in that, Heidi? I reckon there's eight. Okay. Which is kind of quite the feat to get eight colors in and not have any muddiness happen. And that's 
down to the clays too, that they sort of hold their own when they're mixed in amongst um, other colours. There's no bleeding. It's a really good solid clay for that kind of multi-layered work. Well, let me ask you something. Is the white also there? Is the background colour there? No, that's a really okay. good question, Alison. No. Okay. But Different often clay. what I'll do with um, a pearl, I tend to use the Primo pearl. What I'll do is throw a little bit of white opaque um, clay in it just to sort of make it a little bit more opaque, which is then I find those metallic clays then sort of jump off the surface a yeah. whole lot more. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Here are some um, earrings too. I mean, look at that. That's crazy. So that's the original Mokume and the previous pendant is made from that first slice. And it's hard to explain Mokume until we get to my next class. Yep, but yep. yeah, the, the initial slice you take is just as precious as the final slab that these earrings are made from. Very, very, I love that. So happy. And I love this with all the different looks too. And all of that, yeah. Even the sort of um, ancillary pieces like the stud tops and bottoms are all the, the metallic clay as well. As you can see, it's a subtle metallic. It doesn't hit you in the face with sparkle, which I really love. I do too. Considering mm. I don't mind being hit in the face with sparkle, I love what this <laughs> looks like. <laughs> the close up, this has also been sort of um, detailed with some texture and in you can just see some really subtle black line work, which is chalk pastel um, rubbed into the texture. And when you see our presentation a little bit later, mm. um, you'll see also how to make those textures from Miss Cindy Pope. We Everything works together tonight, I'm just saying, people. And I love this. I this love is that. so cute. I mean, just in the, so those are all just solid colors, right, Heidi? Yeah, straight out of the packet, which I know a lot of polymer artists sort of, you know, shy away from, but particularly with this range, I love it. The other thing I'll note about this piece is the background is a pearl and you'll also see the mica shift um, uh, technique used there which just again is one of those magic magic things um, that polymer clay and particularly metallic clays will allow you to do yeah, and a two cure piece so you cure it once with all the holes in it and then you work after it's cured in sort of pushing through those um, metallic pieces and then back in the oven for a second time. Applause, lovely, very exciting. Heidi's class is coming up. Um, check it in, you can look in the handout, check on the site. I don't have the numbers right in front of me what day it is, but buy it now anyway, because you have a coupon code to use. It is so fun, it's so seductive. I'm gonna be very honest too. I know Mags, this will make you laugh. I can just watch the videos. I don't have to make anything. It's still better TV watching them. Anything's out there and very inspiring to watch when everyone is, can make, even if you don't do it, which you will, you'll buy this clay, I just know it. It's really fun. So. Ms. Heidi, thank you for sharing with us that fun, 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 um, Clay, and looking forward to it for sure. And thank, thank you for coming you. on from early in the morning from Australia. <laughs> All right, who's up next? Mags, I think it's you. Oh, is it me? Wait, hold on, Hello. let's see. Let me wake that was up. Heidi, look how cute Heidi is right there. So <laughs> yes, oh, Mags, it is me. and I just want you to know, I spelled polishing right and tool. You did. I see that both <laughs> polishing and tool are spelled correctly, and I appreciate that. You're welcome. Let's just <laughs> let's just see if Sean. No, Sean's not there. Okay, so we're gonna. All right. So what Mags is gonna show you? She's like, I have this tool that's so great for polishing. Now it's polishing polymer clay. But it doesn't mean you can't use it for other things as well. Correct. Correct. But wait till you see what she's come up with here. All right. So here so, is the kit. Yeah. So this is this is not the kit. This is the this is what a lot of people have thought that they could use in terms of felt uh, rotary tools to sand clay. And every time I see a newbie post, this is how they sand their clays. I have a little bit of agita. Um, but if it's a hard pressed felt, you do not want to use it with polymer clay because it will heat it up too much it will gouge it it'll take away too much material and you're not going to be very happy after you spend hours on a piece and then you ruin it Got so it. so that's, that's why we have this little sign that we so that's, put up so the next sign you're going to see is no 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 if it's hard <laughs> felt do not use it with polymer clay that stuff was made for polishing metals it has nothing to do with polymer clay 
So mm -hmm. what I've used in the past are these. These is a muslin cotton buff on the left and a white cotton buff. They call it balloon cloth on the right. And I use that in my Dremel um, to mm -hmm. polish my smaller polymer clay pieces. So I was, and I sell those on my site. So I was on there one day reordering stuff from Rio Grande and I saw that they were, they posted this new tool that was a, a muslin buff, um, but it was soft and it was three separate layers. I think you can kind of see that in the picture mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let me give this a try because, you know, an old dog can use, you know, can learn some new tricks. So I thought I would go ahead and get it and try it. And I'll be darned if it does not work great. I actually can use it instead of um, doing any detail sanding. And that's on uh, objects that you haven't added a lot of texture to, or you haven't handled them a lot so that you get fingerprints and stuff all over it. It's for stuff that you've taken slices of that has a pretty smooth um, finish to begin with. But I found that it works great. So if we start that video. Wait, I have one question. Yeah. It works fine on those pretty metallic clays we just saw too. Right? It would be beautiful. Okay, good. on those right. pretty metallic clays okay. that we use. I was just yes. thinking that. All right, let's see it the would. video and what happens. So I'm going to be doing this in real time for you guys. So these are two pieces of Fimo Professional that were just baked, nothing fancy, just doing the little um, square of it there, and you're going to see in real time how fast this will buff it up. Now, if you want to mirror polish, this isn't what's you're going to use but this is something that's great if you have a piece that's already pretty smooth and you just want to buff it up a little bit and give it a little bit of a sheen i have found that this is really great and this is basically all i use these days on all of my quilt jewelry since all of that stuff is pretty smooth slices when i start mm, um, okay. and and it happens so quick now the one thing you always want to remember anytime you're using any rotary tool with your polymer clay you want to move it around a lot often you don't want to put any, you know, you don't want to sit on one spot for a long period of time. You need to move it around or else the clay will get warm and you could start to, to upset the finish that you want it to have. The other thing is always have a very, very, very light hand um, because you don't really, again, you don't want to dig into um, the clay. Um, now, if you want to do a little bit of sh shaping, you can go a little bit deeper, but see how quickly oh, yeah. that yep. buffed up. Yep. Love I mean, it. I just, I just love it. I love it. So now I'm going to show you what happens when you do the sanded version of it. So this is, this is the same um, clay. I sanded the one piece and now you're going to see me buff up the sanded version. Okay. Now the sanded version whether you're using the cotton buff or the felt buff, you're going to get a really nice high polish shine, but the felt does it a little quicker. Now, obviously, this is not in real time, but it happens. Yeah. It happens as quickly as it did in the real time version. And I haven't seen, um, I was playing with it today to just kind of update myself to see if it had worn out. You know, because they the the um, package is like tin in a package from Rio, and I thought, well, maybe that's because you go through them very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I pulled out a new one to use. I was finishing up some of my quilt jewelry, and I did not see that there was a big difference between the one that I've been using for like three months and the one that's brand okay. new. Um, so now you're going to kind of see the progression of. Um, what the mm -hmm. sanded so the first one on the left is just baked the middle one is sanded and the last one is polished with the felt and now i'm going to show you the sanded one no that's just the not sand okay the one on the left is sanded with the felt buff the one on the right is just the felt buff it gives and depth to the clay it well that that's the truth of i mean most polymer clay i'm going to sand and polish um 
if it's a really nice piece. Um, some production work stuff, I don't really feel the need to do that. Um, so this helps eliminate basically a step that I would normally do with my radial disc on my Dremel or by hand sanding. And this isn't going to work in every case. You have to have a wide, you know, tool um, box of stuff when you're working with polymer because not everything works with every technique that you've done so this is just another little addition into the into the um the finishing box that i that i, I have love it you. i love it i love how that looks um all right we're gonna see oh yes because your class well all right here wait oh, now here you're gonna see the baked now it's sanded so baked, sanded, and now I'm going to think I'm going to do both of the, you would think I would remember this since I, there we go, but cotton buff, that's the cotton buff. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to see the felt buff. And as I said, if it's already, if mm, it's pretty. already sanded, there's not a whole lot of difference in um, the shine that you get between the cotton and the felt. The felt just does it faster than the cotton does. So now both of those are sanded and then buffed with the cotton buff and then with the felt buff. And you can see the difference. Love it. That is a great great tip and there's mags's class come take her um that's a video tutorial so you can get this now. one has this one the reason i put this one up it's great if you're new to polymer because we go through so many techniques but we put a ton of bonuses in here on how to finish um polymer clay so that it's worth it just for that alone to see and you'll see there all the different things that i use i use um mica mesh i use radial disc i do wet dry sandpaper i do the buffing so you'll see everything in that in that class um, to help you learn how to finish your stuff and oh, then I, I put together a kit for everyone if you were interested in doing um i think we have a photo of it allison yep. there we go so there you're going to get some mica mesh um the felt buff the cotton belt buff and the radial disc um, so I put that together as a little package if you want to save a little bit of money on that, but all of it is av available separately on my Etsy site, which you have a link to. Yep. And everything is in the handout. And also yep. there is a um, all kinds of information. Definitely take advantage of the handout there um, because that's a lot of great tips of what to do to make that beautiful finish. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Mags. You're welcome. Uh, all right. Who is that? Now, hold on. Let's check on Sean. Sean did have She's a here. problem. She is, is she here? here? <laughs> yes, yes, Sean. Sean, I'm going to, do, do you want to put on your camera, Sean? Are you okay? Oh, all right, wait, let me, let, what? Let me, let me give you permit. You can start your video if you want. Okay. I know that, um, we were, we were worried about you. We're glad you're here. We hope your mom's okay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and you know what? Are you okay to hang on, on for a little bit and then I'll go back to the front and start your presentation? Is that good for you? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. you don't have to worry about putting on your, um, on your camera if you don't want to either, it's fine. Okay. Um, now, the handout, thank you ladies for all writing in there and helping everyone with their questions. And, um, oh, hi, there you are. Hi, honey. Um, and the handout is, Misty, can you just throw that handout in there again? Because I think when people come on late that the handout doesn't show up, obviously, because it's in the top of the box. And that's why we have to keep doing it. So there's that. Um, all right, so next, uh, we have Mr. Kaplan, you're next. But let me talk first about your product. Sure. I fell in love with it a while ago. Hold on. There's our smiling mags. Um, so some of you have already written in that you know about craft optics. I'm going to explain it in the um, <laughs> pedestrian way of just how I use it, which is, oh, it's really good. I can see really close and it's really helpful. <laughs> and there's a light that comes with it too. It's all great. So 
Jeff is here to explain and talk about what you get and how it's used and how you order it. Plus, he has an offer for you tonight, which will save money, which is all great. So, Jeff, take it away. Sure. So, um, if you are, so I'm Jeff Kaplan, uh, owner of Craft Optics. Um, we, if you've if you've gone to your dentist and you've seen uh, her wearing glasses with uh, magnifiers, and you thought, well, boy, I could really use something like that for for the work that I do. That's essentially what craft optics are. Um, dentistry is actually our background, so I'll go through very quickly, but my father was a dentist here in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, and in the early 1980s, he was sitting hunching over his patients for, you know, eight hours a day, getting terrible back pain, but also having trouble seeing what he was working on, and so he thought, well, if there's a way I can, you know, sit up straight with good posture and still see what I'm doing, that, you know, fine detail work that that, that he was doing, uh, that uh, he might he might come up with something that other people might like as well. So he actually designed basically what you see in the picture here, something very similar to that for himself originally. And once he used it for a while, his back pain went away. He was able to sit with decent posture and also do better work because he could just see so much easier. Now this he was in his 40s when, when, when he started this. Um, so he thought, well, maybe other dentists might like this, and uh, started traveling around the the country. At, dental shows and I, our family, we all went with them and uh, it, it turned into a thing. And so now it's uh, you know, around the world, this type of product, um, we were the first company that did that back then. And, um, and that's how this all came about. Over time, what happened was our patients, the patients of the dental, of our dentists would call our company and say, hey, I'm a jeweler, uh, I'm a, you know, I'm a quilter, I do tattoo art, I do whatever they do, any kind of detail work. And they would say, hey, I want those glasses that my dentist had. And we just didn't have a product for them, but we kept it in the back of our minds. And so a number of years ago, actually 2008, uh, we redesigned the optics, made them lighter, made them a little more cost-effective for everybody. Um, a set like this in the dental world would cost, you know, probably $2,500 or more. Um, so we, we got this down to a, a more reasonable level and all we do now with craft optics is, is, uh, artists. That's it. So it's a really fun group, obviously to work for That's I'm really happy to be here and to listen to all these presentations too, because I learn and get a, you know, get a little understanding of how uh, people work. So what craft optics is, it's a set of glasses. Okay. In the frame, we install your prescription. All right. So your prescription gets installed here. If you wear just readers, we install your reader in the frame. And then the magnifiers drop down and enhance what you already have. So one of the one of the challenges that people have is that they try to buy, they try to take off their glasses and put on some magnifier instead of their own glasses and expect magic to work. And what happens is the working distance is wrong. You wind up still hunching over your work. Uh, you get eye strain, you get back, a lot of back trouble. A lot of our, our jewelry artists, the customers have terrible back pain, and neck pain from hunching over the work. They don't even realize they're doing it for such a long period of time. So what these allow you to do is sit at a comfortable posture. And I, am I, can I share a, my screen, Allison, or is that not? A thing no, that, no, but okay. I can show, I'm, let me show more of the pictures of someone here at. Um... I had a, I had a photo of some, uh, some photos of people working. Yeah. So you kind of get an idea of, uh, of, how people can, can sit and work without hunching over their work. Now, some people are just comfortable working. We have three different working distances in the optics. So it allows you to, you know, you know, we can set something up for the way that you prefer to work. But here, this is the picture I really wanted to show. I like this a lot because, uh, and this is uh, Kathleen Krukoff out in Colorado, jewelry artist. And she is, uh, you can see the posture that she's sitting in, which is just terrific. And you can see how that, and there's, there is a learning curve, you know, everyone's used to hunching over. So the first thing that people do when they get these is they, they lean over and they can't see very well. You actually have to do, the, you know, it's counterintuitive. You have to sit back a little bit. So the way it works is we, we have a, three different working distances to choose from. Uh, we will call your optometrist to get a copy of your prescription. So we take care of that for you. Uh, and out of the box, this, which you saw in the picture, but out of the box, it comes like this. And what is in here is the glasses, your prescription installed, the magnifiers, the light, the green beam light, which is uh, rechargeable, has a rechargeable battery right here, which I'm wearing. And I'll just kind of give you a little 
sample of how bright it is because it's it's a it's crazy bright now. Oh no, it's good. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's very bright. So the way you wear these is you, first of all, you you take the whole setup and you you have a um, a head strap like this. We clip the wire to that head strap to the back of that strap, and then you put the whole thing behind you. You kind of hang it around your neck like this, so that it's the wire is completely out of the way, so nothing's getting in your way. And then when you put them on, you can still see above the magnifiers, so you can see around your work area. Uh, and then, but when I'm looking at here, I'm I, you know, I can't if I lean in close, I really can't see it. I have to be at that working distance. Now there are three three choices: twelve to fourteen inches, fourteen to sixteen, and sixteen to eighteen inches, depending on how you sit. This was determined from oh, what, thousands of demonstrations in person and so forth. We actually made a longer, we, we sell a lot in the quilting and sewing world. And we had um, long arm quilters who sit further away from their or stand further away from their work, uh, requesting a longer working distance. So the nice thing about this is you can see around your work area, grab tools, go into the magnified field, flip up the magnifiers to see through your normal correction to make sure everything's the way you want it. You don't use these to look around your work surface. You look above. And what ultimately winds up happening is you can see with great detail, doubles the size of what you're looking at, but from a nice comfortable posture. And basically you, you're, you're working without having to really move in and out. You're not switching glasses. You're not doubling up on glasses. When you flip these up, if I'm looking at this right, right here, this, I flip this up, I can see it. It's the same distance. I'm not moving back and forth. So it's 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 like natural vision. When I'm looking through these, I'm not getting that sort of fisheye kind of feeling um, that you can get through a, a single lens kind of simple magnifier. So not for everybody, but it's um it's it's a, the kind of thing that once people get it and see it, they really understand when you have this super bright light combined with the magnification, everything you look at is brightly lit and magnified without shadows. So depending on the type of uh, jewelry work you're, you're doing, it's something that people don't really understand. If I have a you know a bright light overhead like this, my hands will still block the light if I'm working on it. But if the light is coming from between my eyes, if I can see it, it's lit. So I never thought about it. You're right yeah, though, Jeff. When I a, use it, you're right. Yeah, it's a huge difference. And people yeah. even even when people have I'll put this down. Even when people have really bright lights at their bench. Um, it's funny to do the demonstration in someone's studio because they'll they'll put it on. They'll say, "Well, I have bright light," and then you they you flip on this light, and then all of a sudden they can see some stuff that they hadn't seen before. So that's kind of a, a an overview of how this works. Um, a lot of the questions we get are, you know, are they heavy? You know, they, they look they look a lot heavier than they are. Obviously, they're going to be heavier than than your own set of glasses. Um, however, it's got a, a, a nose. You see that sort of saddle type nose pad, what it does is it hangs on your nose instead of sitting on two points. This whole thing weighs about 50, or sorry, 48 grams. I've never noticed wearing mine. I never thought heavy yeah, at all. The, the thing is, if you, if, you, if you adjust it, sometimes there's a little adjustment you want to make to the nose pad. Most people want to widen it a little bit, but it's it's really easy to do. The other thing, you just want to make sure that telescopes are all the way down up against the glass. That okay. allows you to just, when you're wearing them, just to look, use your eyes to glance downward instead of pulling them out like this. and then tilting your head, you know, way down and, cr and cranking your neck. So the, the background on this is just years and years of decades, really, of, of, of watching and studying people and how they work and trying to make it comfortable, more comfortable for people doing any kind of detail work. The ergonomics of jewelry making or <laughs> cross stitch or, uh, or tattoo art or aesthetic work or, you know, all these different things, fly tying, they're very similar, actually. People are sitting looking at something tiny, they need light, they're hunching over their work for hours and hours, and that's what we're trying to help. So that's what craft optics are. And It's uh, a good you know, tool for yeah. all of us. Yeah. I can just raise my hand and say yes. Tell everyone you have an offer, a coupon saving, what it is, so people know how to take advantage of it. It's also yeah, in the handout, everyone. Yeah, it's in the handout. It's CraftCast uh, 100, so you save. So this, this is the, it's called the WOW package, because when you put it on and you flip on the light, everyone says, wow. And so all the way back. It's the, that's everything included, the glasses, the light, the rechargeable battery, the, this light will go and it stays at the same uh, brightness for 
uh, 21, a little over 21 hours on a high level. And there's actually a lower setting too, which wow. we use a lot for if someone's doing, working on some reflective jewelry. And sometimes that'll blast, you know, kind of bounce right back at you. And you can, this will swivel. So you can swivel it a little bit out of the way. Um, so that normally is 823 for everything that includes your prescription. Uh, it's 723 with that coupon. And if you just get the glasses alone, we have, it's Craftcast 60, I believe. That's, uh, that'll give you $60 off. Uh, the glasses alone. So the glasses alone are normally 524. That includes um, your prescription. Take $60 off of that. If, uh, and I know, Jeff, your email is in there for everyone who has questions because oh, that yeah. comes up about your prescriptions yeah. and all of that. And I can attest to, Jeff will walk you through everything. So no worries. All your, yeah. um, all your uh, questions will be answered. It's all great. Yeah. Um, and, I would recommend oh. that you do, if you, if you have, if you want to, um, on our video page, we have video FAQs. It's pretty much me looking like this, probably in the same place, telling you the same, uh, some of the same kind of things, but uh, in a little more detail. Um, and also we have on our website, a product wizard, which is I think really, really helpful because it, it asks you the same questions we would ask you if we were in person. Um, and, uh, and then at the end, you get a recommendation. And we spent tons and tons of time on this uh, with customers and just, you know, when the pandemic started, we really, we didn't have any in-person shows anymore. So we had to. Yeah. It's a great way to do that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, very helpful. I know I did yep. even my Warby Parkers that way. So, yep. um, all right. So we all need this tool. We just know it. So it's a good yeah. one. Thank, Thank you, you for walking us through all that and letting us know and having us savings for them. Anyone, if you had any questions, um, go to the craft optics site, everything is in the handout. Uh, and ask all your questions of Jeff. He's great and he'll give you all your answers. So um, treat yourself, take care of your eyes. They're very important. So and you can ask in the chat too. I'll keep, I'm, I'm okay, yeah. around, so you I'll, can, I'll do that as well. That's great. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Okay, sure. People have questions in there. Sure. Thank you. All right. So now I think it's you next, Miss Pam East. Did I spell anything right there? That looks good. Oh, I did. I spelled it. So I was feeling better that day. <laughs> um, all right, so Pam East is our guru in the enameling world here, and she wants to show us um, her favorite enameling trivet. All right, now first, wait, let me back up just that little, little bit. Um, I know it's, it's hard to back up here. Wait, hold on. You just have to sort of go through a few things here. Um, this, no, poopos, no. poopos, no. hold on, hold on, hold on. I shouldn't have touched it. Gotta let, let it go. me talk. I know, I know, hold on, all right, She's get ready, my get ready, get set, already. go, go, oh, there you go. Hi, so yeah, so the um, enameling for, you know, I think uh, um, a lot of you know what enameling is, but in case you don't, uh, we're applying some glass to metal there. And it has to be fired in a hot kiln. In other words, I preheat the kiln. So to get those lovely reds and yellows, and if you would like to do that, take my next craft cast, um, because I'm, that's gonna be all about enameled backgrounds for the scenic pendants. And it's going to be focusing on warm color enamels, which I have not done with you guys before. And they're so, beautiful. I've and seen the pictures. they're gorgeous. Yes. Um, and uh, so I've come up with some tricks for that. You can see the texture right through the enamel, which is trickier than it sounds. But I'll, I'll talk about that when I teach that class. But anyway, the, the main thing is that you're working in a kiln that's at, you know, it's over, it's, you know, around 1400 degrees and you can't be just sticking your hand in there. You, you've got to have your work on a trivet and you need a spatula to get that in and out of the kiln. So you're putting these powdered enamels on and then you're trying to get them in the kiln. And go ahead and show the next picture. Um, so traditionally, and this is how I learned, uh, traditionally you had this little three point trivet and it's flat, you can't pick that thing up. So it has to be sitting on a firing rack and that has to be sitting on a spatula and your work is sitting on top of that. So you've got the stack on top of stack on top of stack and things get out of balance and they topple over and they spill in your kiln. Next thing you know, you got enamel all over the place. And my students, especially, I they were forever, you know, dumping things into the kiln. And 
I tried like every trivet under the sun and didn't really find anything I really liked. The other thing that goes really wrong with this system, and you can show the next video, is that those firing racks, the more you use them, they start to get loose and warped. So this one isn't particularly warped, but it is loose. You can see mm -hmm. how it's just kind of, it's not real tight. And over time, it'll get worse and worse and it'll get really warped. And so then your, your um, trivet's rocking on it. So what we needed was a self-racking trivet. And I, this is the first self-racking trivet I, I saw. Rio Grande came up with this. The problem with this trivet is it's so much metal that it becomes a heat sink. And it pulls all of the heat away from your piece. It takes longer to get your enamels to fuse. It was a real problem. It, it just really, it was a nice idea, but it really didn't work um, because just the mass of metal was pulling all the heat away from the enamels and you need the, the heat focused on the enamels. Um, so this wasn't a good solution. It was also really tall and big and it wouldn't fit in smaller um, kilns, like the trinket kilns and what have you. Um, Thompson enamel on the next photo, Thompson enamel, had a low profile trivet. So this is a small short trivet that um, would allow you to work in the, um, the little trinket kilns. But again, lots of metal underneath your piece and you ended up, it ended up with a heat sink situation and it was really, uh, I wasn't getting a good fuse on my enamels. It would take a really long time and, and it was a real problem. I, I would get discoloration from the heat sink issue too. So these were these were the commercial solutions I went looking for. Did not find exactly what I wanted. So I finally ended up inventing your own. my own. I had to design my own trivets. I had to make trivets that were going to answer all of the problems. Which we can and, on. Yeah. So so in the next photo, you, you're going to see. So here is my. You can let that run. Okay. Um, this is uh, my self racking trivets, and you can see that they have feet. Uh, so they stand up and they're lightweight. They're very lightweight. They're not massive amounts of metal. Um, and this is the universal traf um, spatula and it just picks them up without any use of a firing rack. You do not need a firing rack. And brilliant, when, brilliant. When, I, when I pick this up, I want you to see that the feet are hanging over the edge of that spatula. And that's important. I have students occasionally try and set the try and set the um the the trivet on the spatula and that's not the point you want those feet to hang off so you can get the trivet the spatula in and out so this is how they ship they're shipped flat to save on money and you know because you can just put them in a flat envelope and they have uh they're folded on one side and my pliers are on the fold side right next to that little notch and then i can just go to the other side and by holding it tightly um I can open it up. So when you when you first get the thing, it's going to be flat. And I just wanted to show you how to open it up. And it comes to a very tight point. I can do, I could enamel something the size of a dime down in that point. Again, showing just showing it again. You can see the little notches. My my pliers are on the side with the fold, so that I can open up the unfolded side. And they're, they're super easy to open up. I, you can see I'm just doing it with my fingertips. And sometimes over time, these will get a little warped as you use them, but they're really easy to bend. So you can just bend them back into shape. Um, and there they are. And so you can see how, you know, I could take my piece in and out of the kiln very stably, very easily. Uh, the number of spills in my kilns when I'm teaching has gone down exponentially since I've switched, you can see it's very steady. Uh, the only time it might not be steady is if you have a long, thin piece. Um, long, thin pieces really don't like triangle trivets. I could do this piece in that trivet. I could change its shape a little bit to hold it more steady, but I have another solution. And that is by holding it by four points instead of three points. And this is the tandem four point trivet. And you'll see what I mean by that in a minute. I'm gonna start by folding down the feet. Um, it's so you just fold down the two sides and that's, and again, everything I do is shipped flat. It just keeps the shipping really, um, uh, really inexpensive. Um, and then you fold up the fins and you, when you fold those, you wanna hold the pliers very close to where you're bending. 
um, and because so so that they bend where you want, and you're not just going to mm -hmm. bend the heck out of the out of the um, the fins. And the, it's this is super easy. This just takes like seconds to do. And once it's set up, it stays set up. So that's it. And we only ship them flat to just so that we're not having to give you a lot of extra packaging. You know, we're trying to keep the packaging small. Um, and once I get this all folded, fold, fold, fold. <laughs> it didn't take long. It didn't take long. No. Um, so now you've got essentially two four point trivets. And if you notice, it's got a curve on one end and the opposite curve on the other. This essentially makes it three points of contact when it's sitting, hmm. which is more stable than four points of contact. Um, and so there it is. It's being held by four points instead of three. It's not going to rock. And I can do two at once. So if I'm doing a pair of long slender earrings, I can put them in that, um, that tandem trivet. So now this is the universal firing spatula. It comes folded. It, again, this was a shipping consideration. When, you, uh, when you're shipping something very long, it gets very expensive. It becomes an oversized package. And so we made this that this can actually go get shipped in a small flat rate uh, box at an angle. That's genius. Um, and then you just unfold it. It also makes it easier to store. And we discovered that that doubled up metal right in the middle made the handle much sturdier. Hmm. And so it's a very sturdy handle. And it also works with traditional firing racks. So for some reason you needed a firing rack, you can still use this spatula. I kept it wide at the back for that very reason. And that's it. That's the, the PAMI's trivets and spatula. And that's how I get stuff in and out of the kiln. And I love having smart friends that all come <laughs> up with all these things. I really so, do. That's really genius. I applaud you. Great job. They're in the handout. Those of you who are ending where to get it, it is going to be in the handout. But uh, Art Clay World has them and Rio Grande has them. So yeah, Rio Grande, if, if you go to Rio Grande and just put in PAMIs, by the way, this is the reds and yellows I'm now getting on silver. Um, so, um, and that is not color corrected at all. It really looks like that. <laughs> I want you to know that's not a fake photo. Um, I was, I, I've been working for months on trying to get these reds and yellows to really pop on. She the has. I would hear, I would get texts as I was sitting on the couch at night going, this didn't work. Or, eh, eh, eh. And then I would get the happy, look at this. So, she got, has really been doing it. So Lots uh, and lots of test strips. <laughs> yeah, and you did great. And so everyone's excited about your upcoming class and your tool is great. And um we really appreciate all the work you put in to showing us everything. I know. Okay, everyone's putting in the chat box and helping everyone there with links and if all you of go that. To, so. If you go to Rio Grande and just put in Pam East, a It'll whole page up. of my products will come up, including the trivets. <laughs> and if for some reason you still have questions, just remember, email us at support at craftcast.com. We figure everything out. We get it all figured out for everyone. So, all right, Miss Pam East, brilliant. Love that. Bye. Um, all right, coming up next, we have a cute picture of Miss Pam here. Um, all right, Ms. Cindy Pope is next. Of course, Cindy goes wild. I want to say making. first, yes. I have that spatula. I have two because I lost it once. And I have those trivets. And taking stuff in and out of the kiln is much less dicey with Pam's products. You don't, it just doesn't feel like you're going to have an accident. Mm -hmm. And so I, they're fabulous. Thank you. There you go. So I agree. I mean, it's great to have something like that because it's nerve wracking. That little spatula that you get with your enamels is just like, nope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So totally appreciate it. All right, Ms. Cindy. And then just to be clear, we will do Barbara and Sean. We'll go back to the front and um, pick up your presentation if you're good to go with that. Um, if you're okay um, with that, just let us know. Uh, and um, so now we're, Cindy, of course, has gone wild with making texture plates. So Cindy, walk us through what you're going to show us now. Well, the first thing is I'm doing a silhouette class making texture plates. And one day I was sitting at my workbench surrounded by stuff and I thought I could make some of these by hand. 
And I started making them by hand with just cutting with scissors. And oh my gosh, they turned out fabulously. And I thought, well, I could do an Isle of Tools about this. So um, you don't need the silhouette. Um, you just need this inexpensive vinyl, which is like a dollar for a 12 by 12 inch sheet and an inexpensive uh, acrylic plate. You can also put them on tiles. I like acrylic because you can see it. And the one that I, that really sold me is I did this one layer one, which is I think a half a card or less. And the um, vinyl I used was matte and the acrylic is really a beautiful finish. And so it's really shiny. And the little strips that came out when you push the clay down were really, really shiny and the background was matte and it, and it uh, patinaed really nicely. So these earrings kind of sold me on the whole idea. So I'm going to teach you this one and a bunch of others. Hey, Cindy, do you think if you, you did metal clay, of course, but if you mm -hmm. did polymer clay, do you think it would be shiny and matte too? I, I do. I should have had Meg's yes. polishing stuff. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, she helped me a little bit. I did do some polymer pieces, but they will, uh, they aren't anything compared to what your polymer artists can yes. do. But that's good to know that it picked up both of that as well. That's interesting. All right. I know you're going to show, walk us through some video here. We have got one more picture. Oh, wait, no, we didn't have one more picture. No. So what we're going to do is we are going to do um, that striped one. And what I'm doing is I'm using something called Matte Finish Oracle 651. Now you can use the shiny and it would be all shiny. I just thought it was very interesting how this matte on the top reacted and I thought I got a really beautiful patina with it. So what I do is I'm going to do two layers and this is something else I've never done. I kind of figured it out in the same little brainstorming session. So I'm cutting two pieces in half and then I'm going to double them up and I'm, I can also punch out of this, which we'll show a little bit later. And I'm using two layers or more with most of these. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a little bit of the corner of the backing off, which is always a challenge for me, and just bending it down a little bit and then placing it on top of the bottom sheet, which still has its backing on. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to attach that first little bit, make it smooth. And then I'm taking a burnishing tool. Now I have a kit for sale and I've got a six inch burnishing tool because um, I don't think this little one would work with large pieces. And it, for me, if I want, I have a bunch of layers that are two, three, four, and I just pre-do them all. So, but, but you're pressing down and pulling it and I've never been able to get bubble free adhesive like this. So I've got a little tiny bubble in the back and that's it. You want to burnish it really, really well because burnishing is what activates this vinyl. So more than I showed. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut little waves. And once I've got them done and the backing stays on, once I've got them done, I'm going to put them on the acrylic plate. Now the first one I throw away because it's got a straight side, but you could include that. And what I'm doing is I'm going to be really, really careful to line them up because I want them to match. But in thinking about this, you know, I'm a symmetrical person. They don't have to match. And it might be more interesting if it didn't. But I like those little, very thin stripes um, on the first piece I did. So I was trying, trying to mimic that. But if you want them, you have to pay attention and line them up otherwise it's like putting a puzzle together afterwards you'll never mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you'll never get them in the right order again and we're going to go really fast I do not work this fast but yes you can I've seen you <laughs> <laughs> superwoman I'm very good with video editing it just needs so, some coffee and this is um the white mat there's white and black mat at 651 those are the two choices you can't get the other colors in that and in my class I use it on the, one of the products too and I think it, it it does, it gives it a little bit diff, different finish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not um, textured, but it, it does, it's different than the shiny stuff. And I think it releases nicely, which is important. So I'm gonna save the other piece. I think that's enough. And then acrylic comes with a beautiful paper and you want your hands not oily because vinyl doesn't like oil on the surface. 
but you really don't need to clean it because when you're taking that paper off, it's already pretty pristine. So I just try to keep my fingers off the surface. And it's acrylic is really beautiful. I mean, yeah, really beautiful. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I am going to place these one at a time. Now I didn't bring my needle tool. Um, if you're doing this, you probably wanna grab your metal clay needle tool. It takes the paper off the back a little easier but I'm doing it by hand. So I'm just oh, taking I see what one. You mean. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm getting going to get a little bit different um, result with this one because I'm not placing them quite as close together, but you could uh, do a variation. You could have some that are close together, widen it up and then close it back up. You could mm -hmm, get, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. could create so many looks. I was just blown away. I did the first one and I'm like, why have I never done this? I've been doing vinyl for a long time. Mags also does vinyl. And, um, but it, it creates a really different thing. And, you know, you can cut any shapes. You could cut a bunch of little shapes. Um, in the class, we have a really thick vinyl called brick that you heat transfer. I just took all the extra pieces and cut triangles out with stripes. And made oh yeah, that's texture. great in the class. So, yeah. um, which I, I think a lot of us are very structured in our work. It's kind of fun to throw caution to the wind and just cut things up. But now, that's why we love all done, you guys, because you're willing to do that. Yeah, I, well, it's just I have my moments when this happens. So you really want to burnish it well here, because the action of pushing that down is activating the adhesive. This is a um, long tack adhesive. Um, so in about 24 hours, it'll be permanent. So let's see what it looks like. And yeah. you must have silly putty. Yes, I do. Yeah, and so what I love about this, you can look at the back and make sure the texture took and mm -hmm. you could press nice. it down if it didn't. Nice. So here we go. This, These are my powder coated earrings and I made these little silver dots. And again, a really easy thing. I'm using three cards this time. And I'm using one of my cool tool texture plates because this is my favorite one because you know there's like so many different choices i've actually made open dangle earrings with this shape and i i love it i might make some more went to my mother's and she stole my dangle earrings that were very much like the pink ones so what i'm doing is just you don't have to do the shape but if, if you know what shape you're going to want you can draw the shape on the back and then just you know draw in kind of where you want things. You don't have to stick with it, but it's kind of nice to know what your pattern is. And then I've got a 1 16th and a 1 8th inch. And I also, almost everybody has a 1 quarter at home because that's what you use for um, letterhead. And these are pretty inexpensive on uh, Amazon. I gave you a link for the ones that I thought were the best quality and for the price. But I started with the one I had hanging around the house. I had to go hunt it down and uh, decided that this was this was a go. So I'm just, I'm kind of not following my lines completely, my little holes, but I'm going to make some extra ones to see what it looks like. And then I'm gonna take the Silly Putty, which I've already rolled out. And I'm gonna turn it upside down and just give it a roll or two. And I did the galaxy earrings the same way. I just used India ink and powder coat, clear powder coat. And this turned, this is a, it's so funny when things turn out that you don't expect to turn out. Um, and then I can go ahead and cut it out. So fun, fun little technique. Nothing like a, an Audi running down a piece to that give you some great. interest. So this is the, another one where I'm going to show you how to do this using um, hole punches, but I'm also going to show you how to design a freeform one using a circle. So if you're cutting, you can do eight layers. We're talking a really, really thick texture plate. Um, if you're punching, you could do four layers. And my quarter hole punch, they can go through eight layers too. I'm going to have to... Um, when you go through four layers, I'm gonna show you how to sand the edges up, up a little bit. But so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do eight layers of white, that's the bottom dot, which will give you a nice base for your piece. 
And I am doing an any so a Pam could enamel it. Yay! <laughs> and um, it punches really easy. Now these punches punch really easy. Other ones are going to punch less. But this particular um, design is really good. And then I'm going to do one layer, one four uh, sheet layer, and then another four sheet layer on the top. And I always punch with the paper side up. It seems to work better. And of course, I had one of these just in my little, I make punch earrings for metal play. Um, so I had these around and I tested with one before I bought more. But then of course I needed three sizes. And then I'm just cutting a hole. But when you go through four cards, sometimes it's a little rough, especially on a smaller punch. So I'm just using Cool Tools Flash Shiners to just sand up the edge and make it nice and smooth. You know, metal clay doesn't show, if it's not complete e over each other, it, it really doesn't show as much you would th as you would think it does, but it's, I like everything nice starting the project. Along each step, I like to refine Keep it. Keep it as you go along. Yes, I get a better outcome. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the back off the hardest part. And you can imagine circle textures, um, all kinds of circle textures. I have lots of circle textures. Um, I like circles a lot. And then you really want to burnish it well. And because we're layering up, each layer needs to be burnished because you want to activate the adhesive. So you have to burnish each layer as much as you burnish the first one, actually probably more. And it, the more you burnish, the more permanent it's going to be. Hmm. Okay. And this one, again, I'm using the matte finish. You could totally do shiny. You could do shiny and matte and shiny and matte, and then it might finish in, a, in an interesting way. I'm kind of into the whole black and white thing. You were even saying the other day that um, you're using these on, both Cindy and I have been doing throwing clay and working with ceramic clay. So you can use these kind of texture plates on all kinds of things. You can, I, I'm, I'm starting pottery and I have all these ideas based on what we do in a very small form. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very fun. I've made a lot of texture plates that I've used already. And then it's your own design, which is the best part. You're not buying, you know, I mean, it's great. There's so many wonderful ones to buy as well, but it's fun to add in your own as well. And then it has a long tack time. So, um, you know, if I burnished it down, it wouldn't come, probably come up. But if you kind of misplace it, it's easy okay. to lift. Um, it's an interesting product because of the way that it becomes permanent over time. Hmm. Okay. Again, burnish, burnish, burnish. So, but what if you don't have the hole punches? The hole punches are a little pricey. So I'm going to show you how to do a free form one once we take a look at our final texture. And again, you can go to the back and make sure the outside is perfect. That's which a great, is yeah. a good thing about acrylic. You can use both sides, but a lot, I often only use one side. It's inexpensive. And there you go, Pam, all different colors of blue in that um, mm -hmm, layered texture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So- You um, got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should send something to Pam to enamel. She's much better. I can enamel, but I'm just not as good as Pam. I'm gonna take another little class with her though, coming up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the same thicknesses, but this time I can do the eight layers all together. I don't have to put two together because this, my Joyce Chen's will easily, if you have nice scissors, they will easily cut through eight layers. And I'm just, I'm obsessed with topographical lake maps. My mom lives on a lake. I think that has something to do with it. So I'm just using a circle template those and are I'm kind of, now. Yeah, I'm kind of designing it as I go, just making it curvy. Maybe Pam can help me enamel a Glen Lake, Michigan. There we go. My mother would love that. <laughs> and so this is just paper I'm doing this on. And then I'm going to cut the paper out and use it as a template with the vinyl. Ah, okay. And That's this fine. is um, 16 layers. I have a little cheat sheet here is 
two and a half cards, which is a pretty thick texture. Pam usually um, wants them to be at least, is it two cards deep? Two car, um for what? I'm sorry, my- For textures? Yes, how, yes. For, for your chambers, you want them at least two cards, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, so that, that takes you deeper than two cards. So here is before I started the class, all my testing. So now I have twice as many as these, but, um, and I haven't even made all these making, and this is the class I'm doing and I'm using the free version of the software. So if you're interested, um, I'm, you don't have to pay for the software. You can oh, that's play great. With it. For the silhouette software you're talking about, right? <laughs> yes. And if yeah. you don't have a silhouette, you probably have a friend with a silhouette or a cricket. You could also use a cricket. Um, so the first one I'm doing is kind of an overall low profile texture tape, uh, texture mat, kind of like Sealy Fago used to do with the tearaways. Oh yeah, you yeah, can, yeah. Yeah, you can make these two layers um, and I'm gonna show you in a, a different uh, pro project how to layer up. But I, I think having your own design texture plates, I also um, go to like uh, Shutterstock and get some things, but pretty much I, I usually create my own textures. And I've been doing a lot of that with my online Facebook group. We've yeah, it's making drawings and turning those into textures. It's really fun. So texture type two is a, a deep project texture plate where you're layering up. So with the silhouette, the thickest I've cut is two layers. So I'm just doing two layers and I'm just layering them all up. So if I do um, eight layers, that is, have to look at my- How many cards? Eight cards. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> cheat sheet. Yeah, I think it's it's um, two and a half cards. Oh, the, oh the, the other one was four, four cards. So two and a half cards um, is that eight layers. Couldn't, can't just keep that straight. I have to look at my cheat sheet. So this one is just putting these layers up to get a really deep texture. Again, good for enameling. And it'll look like that. Yeah, this one is not quite as deep, but um, that's just a something I uh, designed in this in um, a little app. Lovely. And turned it into a piece. And this is a, was a really nice deep texture. And I did an inlay of powder coating. And I think it turned out really fun. So that, that um, it looks like black, but it's really a shiny purple. I couldn't get a good color. And um, someone just asked what machine I'm using. Um, you, since the Curio's not being made anymore, I'm so sorry to tell you all, makes us all sad. You can use the Portrait 3, the Cameo 3, the Cameo 4, or um, the Curio. And in the class, I'm using three machines just to show you there really isn't a difference, a huge difference. I'm gonna tell um, you that you're talking about this Saturday's class. Yes. At this class, it, it, the, the bonuses alone, you'll learn everything. I mean, it's, it's an amazing class. So you'll, your mind will be blown seeing everything that Cindy's doing with these machines and the silver. I have four bonuses. There was gonna be one That's and crazy. I don't know yeah, it, what it, happened. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> you get the silhouette basics, you get all the settings, it, read all about it. It's amazing. So this is so fun. I love all these original sort of textures. Okay, so now here is type three. Type three, that this one is a um, heat transfer vinyl called Brick, and it's two and a half cards thick. And um, I love this. And um, Mags helped me actually uh, make some pieces in polymer clay. We, we talked a little bit about how to do polymer clay textures, but this to me um, is very, I don't necessarily always go really bold. I tend, tend to go fine and I love the boldness of this texture. And we have texture on top of the texture. Oh yeah. Because right. we have put it on fabric. Now you can put it on fabric with no pattern, but I like the ones with the bold fabric. So you need to take your silly putty to Joanne's and get some fabric. If you're gonna take this <laughs> I just <laughs> realized what, what are you doing? Yeah, putting yeah. silly putty on all the fabric. You need cotton or cotton poly or polyester. A little silly uh, putty in your pocket there. Yes, I went there and I was so mad at myself because I didn't bring my silly putty. So here's yes. the polymer clay ones I did. And this is that same um, brick vinyl texture. 
And if I could have used the polisher, ah, <laughs> there you go. Suggested, I'm going to go get a kit. Um, but it really worked beautiful with polymer. I had to put cornstarch on to release mm -hmm. instead of oil, but these work great with metal clay. I was really surprised. I thought the metal clay would kind of stick in there, I but did. They work, they work really, it's one of the easiest rolls I had out of all the textures. Let me ask someone, I see Ellie said, is there a class for powder coating? We do, Ellie, just um, maybe Misty, if you can look it up and, and drop it in there. Uh, did you did you watch our powder coating class, Cindy? I did not. Oh, okay. We uh, talked because, about maybe doing one next year too. Yeah, but because you think it has to be like a car or something gets powder coated, I guess, or something. But we do have a class and you, um, you can do it in a, I'm pretty sure she did it just in one of those toaster ovens kind of things. Toaster it's interesting. Oven. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> all right. So now texture type four. Okay. okay. This is my favorite. This is a 3D texture plate. You know how we use the silhouette. If you use the silhouette, you have kind of a flatter piece or you cut different layers and you layer them together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I figured out how to do a 3D texture. This is also really nice if you have a high shrinkage clay. So if you have a high shrinkage clay and you're putting layers together, when it fires, you're more likely to have cracking or movement or a chip. But if you're rolling it as one piece, mm, okay. and um, Pam has a class where she uses these little flower molds and you kind of create, you roll these pieces more like you do a mold because they're so deep. Okay. But yeah, I, love this because um they're nice and 3d so you can see the can egyptian see eye in the yep. back yep cool how you get that 3d and i used to do this by cutting the layers out and trust me this is a lot easier oh yeah <laughs> plus you can check it easily with your silly putty mm -hmm. and here is a scarab i did and i did some polymer clay scarabs no i'm talking about the one where you did the little molds and you put them in the frame pam Oh, okay. sorry. Okay. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, so, and this is, Pam is the one that I first saw who used molds. So this one is really detailed 3D. So I just wanted to show you, you could do a detailed multi-layer 3D texture. So. That's cool in the silver clay. I love that. That is really a deep texture. It looks great. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it kind of was a revelation. Oh yeah. It's one of those things cool that look. I saw people cutting vinyl and thought, I can do this. And here's the Egyptian eye again from down on top. Yeah, that is cool. And it's one roll. And if you're doing any, I don't do a lot of production, but if you're doing any kind of production, this is a lot easier than making your stuff on the silhouette. And to do this, you can't get easily get this 3D texture on the silhouette. Yeah, that's so, And cool. vinyl is inexpensive and acrylic is inexpensive. And there's the picture of my <laughs> desk, <laughs> but this is only a small portion of what I have. Now of I have course. twice as many. <laughs> it's, it's a really fun class. And like I said, it's the free software. Um, you also, Barbara has a great texture plate class. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you do, don't use polymer clay, but you kind of want to test these techniques out, Mags has, um, her bead class that she just mentioned. And there's also a cutouts one that also gives you lots of good technique. Basically, we're looking for another lockdown or pandemic is what we're saying here to just watch and make because not really saying that, but sort of. So. Oh, yeah, mind blown. Miss Cindy Pope, her class is coming up this Saturday. Come join us. You'll be, you'll, yeah. It'll, it'll be, be like, fun. Oh, yeah. It'll be like, oh my gosh, what should I do next? So um, Cindy's always pushing the envelope for us and, and coming up with new things. I love that 3D looking, that last one there. I think that's a, a look that's unique just to that. That's great. So that looks totally fabulous. And metal smiths will look at it and say, hmm. Yeah, exactly. How did you, how did, how did, you do that? You know, yeah. I love we that. We love one. that. You know, we yes. love that. We live for that. We, we do. do live for that. <laughs> we do. <laughs> yes, we do. We do. Oh, look, I spent, I spelled glass right. I'm so pleased that that happened right there. <laughs> <gasps> Miss Barbara Becker-Simon, are you there? 
Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. So let me introduce you. Barbara, we have two more presentations, not too much longer. Um, Barbara Becker Simon, okay. First of all, let me just introduce you by showing some of her work. I mean, Barbara does all kinds of amazing work. She's known for her glass work, her glass beads, I'll show you in a second. She's known, known for her metal work, for her metal clay work. Um, she is an artiste and does fabulous work. Then she came up with something and I said, look at that in metal clay. I said, Barbara, I think you need to be our feature artist and just show off your new necklaces. This is not a class on making these, but she's just showing what she's now selling as an artist. But I thought, oh my gosh, they're so delicious. We have to look and, um, and have her show off. There are her glass beads that she did and known for. Um, so much fun. Uh, another piece of hers all there in the bracelet. But now, tell us what you're doing, Barbara. <laughs> oh yeah. A friend of mine taught me how to make glass chain. Oh. And for those of you who uh, know glass products, this is I'm using borosilicate glass here, not soft glass. Uh, borosilicate. Uh, some of you may know the brand name Pyrex. So it's a hardier type of glass. It was so the COE of that. The um, oh jeez, uh, that's all right. I know Venetian <laughs> glass. I think is ninety, and I think it's different, right? Uh yeah, and you know, COE isn't really important to you know you just the right, okay. out there, <laughs> but just know that it's very hardy. Now okay. it doesn't it it doesn't like to be dropped from a great distance on a hard floor. Okay, that's fair. Let's just get clear with that, but it it's very hardy. So um, and this is the yeah. clear one, correct? This is clear, and it's a classic. It's just sparkly and it. beautiful. This is my glass area in my studio. That's my very sexy torch there. Um, and uh, all the glass in the background is is beautiful. What I call stringers, but I'm not using that. I'm using uh, rods, glass rods that range four to five millimeter in diameter, sometimes a little bit more. And um, some of my tools, these are tungsten tipped tweezers. Tungsten does not stick to hot glass, so that's really very handy. And then this is sort of a paddly tool. A lot of people would use just an old um, paring knife to do what that tool does too. And then I have these mashers that help me flatten things if I need to flatten them. So uh, it's not, they're not a very complex amount of tools. That is a <laughs> graphite rod that I use to help me shape the links, et cetera. So, and just some run of the mill tweezers to hold on while I'm doing stuff. Uh, I'm gonna show you only a small part of the process because uh, it was taught to me and I, I don't wanna give any trade secrets away. This is a bunch of borosilicate glass that I have that uh, I'm going to, that I have made chains out of and eventually we'll make some more. And they're the colors of the glass that uh, are manufactured in, in borosilicate are just amazing. Um, these are the rods up on top, then I cut them into shorter pieces uh, somewhere. These links uh, start out, out as about two and three quarters in length. And there's the, the, just the plain old links. And then there's a bit of a chain there. So you can see the progression. I love it even in clear, but wait till people see the colors. The clear is so sparkly. It's just yeah. a classic. It's yeah. beautiful. The colors are fabulous, but. So in the beginning of the process, I'm taking a longer rod, which is called a punty. And I'm going to attach one of these link rods to it. And because uh, I need to hold on, I need the, the punties are basically holders, they're handles. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm using them to hold on to this short piece so that I can manipulate it the way I need to. So I'm gonna run it uh, through the flame, rotate it while I run it through the flame. And um, it's going to soften in the middle and kind of get kind of wobbly. 
And once it gets a little wobbly at the right temperature, not too wobbly, I'm going to create a bend. And it happens pretty fast. Now you can see it's a little red. You can see it's mm -hmm. going out of the straight now. And I'm gonna bend it around. And you can see how the handles, the punties uh, work for you. So that's the first part of creating the link. Um, this is an example of, I don't know, is the sound on this? No, no. Oh. I know we can't um, hear it. It has a wonderful tinkle, little tinkling. The yeah. tinkle is absolutely wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm, I'm making um, sterling clasps to hold these on. This is a, a long chain that you can wear doubled up or you can uh, wear it single length, whatever you want to do. But they just sparkle, the clear just sparkles like that. It's really great. Um, uh, and if you look at me right now, I'm wearing three, two chains, and, but, and one of them is the um, doubled up. We'll see the green in a second. I love that color you have on, Barb. Uh, yeah, limeade. See it. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. This is my favorite color, chartreuse. So I had to get glass that was that color. <laughs> yeah. That is just to die for a beautiful it's color. It's yummy. So. It's yummy. Yeah. The um and this particular glass has a little of a, a blue shift to it, depending on the light that it's seen under. Uh you can't see it in my um my phot photography box here. This is called Wild Honey, and this has Pretty. an amazing color shift, especially outdoors. It, you can see blues and yellows and oranges. You can see a little bit of the shift here. There we go. You can yep, see yep. a little of the purplish on it, but it's just stunning. And some of these shifting glasses are amazing. Beautiful. Amazing. Yeah. There here, it is in it. The, here it is in oh the sunlight. My gosh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that it's gorgeous? Yummy. Yeah. <laughs> yummy, yummy, yummy. We're so, basically you know, all squirrels here, or all dogs seeing squirrels here at this point. It's like, <laughs> wait, there it goes. It's so pretty. This is another shifting glass. Um, in one light, it is this very delicate lavender. And then you'll see in a second when I shift the, turn it off, Oh, it becomes a, a delicate gosh. kind of olive green. So, you know, you can have this on and wear it in the sunlight. And then you go into the restaurant or wherever you're going to go. And it's a different color. There it goes again. Wow. I so, mean, they're just magic. Just magic. I, I mean, love applause. Them. That's so beautiful. And so, thank you. Yes. And that's Barbara's lightweight. Yeah. Easy beautiful. to wear. Yeah. And you can, if you're interested in them, uh, I display them on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and you can also use that um, email right there to contact me if you're interested. I have a couple all ready to go. I have a black, I have a wild honey, I have a couple of uh, clear ones. So, um, and the production will go on. <laughs> now that I'm recovered from hurricane, I, I That's am right. Ian, idiot. Hurricane idiot. <laughs> um, I'm I'm gonna get back to the tour. Ready to go. Yeah, Barbara. I always love your work, and I love how you go Thank off in you. a new direction. And those are stunning. I was so happy you're Fabulous. willing to come on and show us all Thank what you're you. doing. Um, everyone, support an artist. Buy a present for yourself. I say, buy glasses, <laughs> buy a reasonable. trivet. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> buy jewelry. Yeah. I mean, come on. Thanks Someone for the told me. Oh, are you kidding? My pleasure. Someone told me years ago, I love going on. I read this on a Facebook thing. I love going on on I Love Tools. Just come on, pour yourself a glass of wine and bring your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's wrong with that? Uh, all right. Thank you. All right. We're going to go now. Um, Sean, I'm going to unmute you right now. She said, don't forget to unmute me. I got to find you in here. And I hope Sean is feeling better. She's a little under the weather there. Um, wait, I see you. Boop, booty, boop, boop, boo. No, I know why. You muted yourself, so you moved down. I'll find you. Hold on. There you are. I'm asking you to unmute. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Don't I worry forget about coughing. Yeah, I figured you wouldn't want me coughing through everybody's <laughs> presentations. <laughs> 
we appreciate that. Blue. Um, all right, let me go back to the beginning of yours because I was like, I know a lot about photography, but I can't do this. We're going to have to wait for Sean. So thank oh, you for coming sorry. on. Don't worry about if you have to cough. We understand. We just want everyone to feel okay. But that's good. We got to see that again. Everyone, that was Tools 2002 is your code to get 25% off at CraftCast. So you have that. So now Sean, Sean also has a class coming up. You can check out her class. She's doing an interchangeable cuff out of metal clay, but she also happens to be genius at doing um, photography. So I said, would you come on and just give everyone some tips on photography? So she has a little presentation here. She's going to walk you through the do's and the don'ts. Yes, I am. I am a big fan of photography and I'm always asked the question, um, how to take good photos with your phone? We've all got pretty decent cameras on our phones these days. So um, your phone can take a pretty good um, photo. The first thing I always say to everybody, and this is something I don't think people really think about when they're taking photos with their phone, is to get yourself a tripod, just a small one, because even if you think you're stable with taking a photo, the chances are you're not. And you're going to get that little bit of a blur and then you'll get really annoyed and thinking, why is my, it doesn't look like I'm taking a, a shaking or taking a blurry photo, but you are. And my absolute favorite little tripod is one of these ones um, that's called a flexipod. And this is because you can manipulate it and you can have it standing up as a proper tripod or you can move it around and it makes taking photos really easy. So that is um, my first really big tip is to, to look out for one of these little tripods. They are not expensive. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. Go ahead. Um, I also think that those actually, um, can't you just wrap those little arms like around a pole too? So you can sort of put yeah. your, yeah, you can put your camera wherever you want it. Yeah. So yeah, they, they come in handy all over the place. I yep. take, I take them as a, in fact, even if you want to do a family photo, just wrap it around a tree branch and everybody like stands. We, I've used it all over the place for all sorts of pictures. So the other thing that um, I get, I suggest everybody gets, and they're really cheap, these entry level little light tents. Now, you can't do everything in a tiny light tent, but they're really cost effective. And to just get some really nice clean shots, especially if you're somebody that's wanting to sell your work um, or even just show everybody what you're doing on social media. It is nice to prop photos, but often if you're trying to sell stuff you do want to get at least one clean background a, a shot with a clean background that's either mm -hmm. sort of a plain white or black mm -hmm. and these little tents do that really easily and they work off um, a standard USB plug so you know you can even I, I use my plug that comes that came with my phone so the cable for this little um, tent plugs into into that and I also carry this around with me sometimes because I have one of those big they call them power banks but they're essentially mm -hmm. just a huge battery that mm -hmm. you can carry around um, and these work off those as well wait isn't this a picture of a power bank here yeah so that's my power bank so if I'm nowhere near uh, a socket or actually I I teach silver clay sometimes so I carry this little thing around with me when I'm teaching classes because it's really easy to then get some nice shots of students mm -hmm, work because mm -hmm. often we rush around trying to get photos of what people are doing and um, the you get all sorts of random photos but it's quite nice if you can carry a, a little tent makes it easier yeah and I love these power banks are brilliant because we all we all run out of phone battery all the yep. time don't we oh, yeah. so uh, yeah are big problems. But, yep, they're a lifesaver. <laughs> right. All right. So these are your extras, you said. They look Yes. So these are my little these these are the really expensive equipment that yeah. I carry around me all the time. Good old True. masking. Yeah, yep. I know. I know. I'm a great one for raiding the kitchen, the garage, whatever I need to get what I want to use. Um, so 
my go-tos are good old masking tape. Um, we call it blue tack here. You, mm -hmm. do you guys call it, do you call it blue tack? I think no, that's there's a brand. called paint tape. Well, that painter's looks like tape. a painter's that tape. Painter's yeah. tape. Oh, that's yeah. painter's tape. Yeah, the little ball that's sitting in front of it. You know the stuff, I mean. Oh, poster tape. Okay. Poster tape. Oh, is poster, that what you, yeah, you poster. Poster tape? Tack. Okay. Poster tack. Poster tack. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Because it, in it, you know, that's what we use to all like put our posters up on the wall. We call it blue tack here in the UK, and I'm guess it's because it's a, that's a brand, but you can use any version of it, and that's is just really good to help you prop whatever you're putting in there because often if you're if you've got one of these little tents and you need you you're struggling to shoot or you don't want to shoot flat down because it's going to make your piece look flat and you want to put it up at a slight angle because that actually just makes it look a little bit nicer mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. just take a tiny little bit of the tack and push it on the back of the piece and then you can really manipulate it to to sit at the angle you want and because it's sticky it will just hold it there for you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, and yes. then the other the other things you see there are um I use the craft the foam back craft board and I buy a big sheet cut it into little pieces and those are used um as backing boards for jewelry sometimes if I'm if I'm wanting Wait, we have to some here. do something yeah and uh, so I either cover it with fabric sometimes that's just black sort of fake suede fabric and then I cut lots of little pieces so I've got lots of pieces to use and the clamps that were there they just hold they just hold them in place um, and make it easier to be able to have be hands free which um, is an advantage if if you're taking photos and then reflect and then lines. yes I get on my soapbox about reflection anybody who knows me knows I will go, harp on about using reflection in your photos 24 seven. And my favorite reflection is kitchen foil. It does a perfect job, wrap it around a piece of cardboard and you'd be surprised even with those tiny little light tents, it's really surprising how you can push a bit more light back into the front of a photo to get a bit more definition. And it's not necessarily about making your entire photo lighter. It's about getting a bit more light onto certain areas so you can you can just get more definition into mm -hmm. the piece that you're trying to shoot. And you'll see there's one piece sitting there that's got a hole in it. That's because I stick that to the front of my phone and that hole is just where my lenses are. So I'm also, if there's a bit of, because of course my phone's quite dark and if I'm shooting something that's really shiny and silver, I want to take out that you can see my phone actually mm -hmm. reflecting in the piece. Mm -hmm. So I use a piece of foil just cut out the right sort of shape that goes over where the lenses are and then yeah it just takes out any reflection you've got of your phone in your piece and sean do you purposely crinkle your foil for that because usually you see reflectors flat and shiny yeah i have experimented with crinkling the foil and not crinkling the foil and what do you think it, it does actually depend on if you have a large really shiny area if okay. you've got a fairly large shiny area then the crinkle in the ref if you crinkle the reflector it will show but the majority of the time if the areas that are shiny are fairly small it doesn't matter too much and a lot of my reflectors are wrinkly because I, I use them forever yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's really hard to keep it nice. But you can see that's a fairly new piece that I've that yep. I've got there that to to put over my um my phone. Yep. No, I got it. It's I'm with you. Pretty. So this is just um to show that you can actually use this setup. And that it does Beautiful. work if you take if you just take a little bit of time, because this is just a photo of one of my pieces using my phone, using the on the tripod that I that you've seen with the exact tent that you've seen using the uh, camera app. Um, I think this one is even the native camera app on my iPhone, though I do actually have a couple of the other camera apps as well um, and kind of go between them because they all do slightly different things. Oh yeah, beautiful. 
So this photo is showing you how that how I actually staged that um, that necklace so it so I could shoot it like that. And this is just a piece of the foam board with um, the blue tack poster tack just holding the shape um, for me. It's this. I chose to do this this one this way and stick it against the back because the, it's on a leather cord. So it's quite good at holding its shape anyway. And it's not like a, a dangly chain. You'd struggle to get kind of something that was on a loose chain to to sit this way. But mm -hmm. anything that's got a little bit of structure, this it, it would work to actually hold it firmly in place. And then this is this is the setup to show you how that actual um, shot is achieved. And I have just propped that whole board. So the back is leaning against the back of the tent underneath the rear set of lights. And I've just put another little piece of that um, that post attack at the front so that the net, the whole thing's not going to slide. And then I've got my my foil making sure that that there's no reflection of my phone in the piece and I've also raised the tent up a little bit the light tent uh, by just sticking a box underneath it I often find to just have that the tent raised up a little bit gives you a little bit, bit more wiggle room mm -hmm. in terms of the angle because um, you might want to play around with the angle that you're getting know, um, so it's perfect mm -hmm. yeah that's a good setup Oh, and this again, this is me just showing you how um, how I've literally set up this. Uh... Hey, that's how we did it with yeah. 35 millimeter was that kind of thing yeah. was, you know, keeping uh, your camera out of frame like that. Well, you forget. Time. I think you forget a lot. And actually people people forget a lot as well that be mindful of what you're wearing. Because yeah, yeah. It, because you it's reflect true. in your stuff as well. Yeah. And um, I've worked with enough professional photographers, more like, what's that red dot in the photo? And it's probably my jumper or something yeah, I'm yeah, wearing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is uh, to show how um, I have used, you can, if you look at on the left hand side, you can see the, the tent is set up and what you can see on the right hand side of the tent is I've used a bit, a bit of that white foam board to block out some um, dark shadows. So if you look at the actual shots of the two pieces of jewellery, the top one is without that board in place. So you can see there's quite a dark Huge. black box. A block and that's because that's just part of the room reflecting um, onto the jewellery because this is a relatively shiny piece so just by propping up a little piece of that white card I've managed to pretty much block out almost that entire um, dark shadow so I'm always just being conscious of what what's going on in the room around me having lots of these little pieces of card just mm -hmm. so I can block it's amazing out. how just that little piece will make the difference too oh yeah huge difference yeah huge difference yeah. and you'll be so much more happier with your piece yeah at that point yeah it yeah. really is Absolutely. okay you're showing yeah. us so something there we there. go oh there it yes. is that's it just okay. showing you yeah just so you can see um, that's where the board that's went. what that's doing that one tiny yeah. little piece of board is yep. um achieving that for us it's the white bouncing back in. So it's, um, yeah, it yeah. makes all that difference. So um, the other thing I use with these little light tents is um, I, I make my own, you can see really badly cut piece of fabric. I make my own backgrounds and just, um, because these these tents do come with backgrounds, but a lot of them have a really specific texture and I'm not a big fan of it. So I prefer to kind of use fabric and things I mm -hmm. find mm -hmm. to get the kind of tex textured background I want. And I've just stuck it again on the back at the very top um, with a bit of um, masking tape just to hold that in place. Mm -hmm. And then it's uh, it's hard to see, but it's on, it's on a, a sort of a gradual little kind of curved angle. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not going to get a kind of hard line where um, the background meets kind of mm -hmm. the base mm -hmm. yeah that's very cool so another another little tip is um using fishing line or just monofilament to hang um earrings on and uh this is i had to video this because 
people don't naturally think of darkening a photo down. But the problem with one of the issues with these light tents is your phone can overcompensate for the amount of light it thinks the photo needs. I'm just so, holding on that because you can really yeah, see how the darker. Yes. Yeah. So as soon as I let go, my phone, the kit, you know, the app goes, oh, no, it needs to be much lighter. Yeah. And it, it kind of flicks it back up again. But that's just me. I like to take a photo, have a look at it, make sure it's um, it's looking it's looking good. But think about actually not only lightning photos that need to be a bit brighter, but darkening ones if the uh, your phone is overcompensating. Which it will for silver. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. yeah, especially if you put in a dark background. If yeah. you've got yeah. a light background, it tends to be okay. If you're putting in a dark background, it, it overcompensates for the right. fact that the, the background is black. Right. And this, um, the one other thing, if you've got a lot of shiny pieces, again, that these little light tents can struggle with, is the they have the LED strips, which are lots of those tiny little dots. So if you're struggling with those tiny little bright dots showing up in your piece of jewellery, you can just get a piece of masking tape. And what I've done here is taped, um, not masking tape, sorry, a bit of tracing paper with a bit of masking tape. And what I've done is just tape it across the front and I've draped it. Mm. So it's not sitting anywhere near the light. It, you, to diffuse the light, Diff you need yeah, to make yeah. sure they're at the the tracing paper is sitting away from the light and I've just um it does block out a bit of the light as well so you do have to compensate a little bit and just lighten the um make the photo a little bit brighter uh, but with phones that that's pretty easy and then I've just propped the that tracing paper out of the way again with a bit of that um that post attack it really cleans up the background yeah yeah beautiful it really does. These are excellent tips. And I know everyone is working with their phone. And if you're doing your jewelry, you do have to send in your pieces on a white background or a dark background, but simple backgrounds. These are great tips to get a better exposure. And then Miss Sean yeah. will be teaching how to make this cuff in one of her yeah. classes coming up. Ooh, so check I that will. out as well. Yeah. So those links are all in the handout. What are you going to say, Sean? Um, only the my final tip is okay. to um, think about shooting your same piece of jewelry on light and dark backgrounds mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the the same piece as you can see here looks really mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. on yep. different backgrounds. So do a bit of experimenting to get get the look you want. And I yeah, love it on the white in that case. I think it yeah. pops. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Applause, applause. Right. I mean. We've learned a lot tonight. I'm very excited. We made it through another I Love Tools. Somehow we did it again with all these wonderful guru professionals. Let me just, since I'm near the front of this video, let me see if I can find our little um, can I, Am I allowed there. to answer a couple of chat? I Absolutely. A couple of chat questions. Yep, Pam, go for it. Um, I, yes, I do more often. Pam's asking, um, am I using the native camera app or a third party camera app? So. It depends on what I'm shooting. I have, um, I, I will default to my native camera app initially. And if I'm struggling, because the one thing I use an iPhone and the one thing iPhones really struggle with is white balance. So often I get a blue yeah. cast on my photos and that I really find annoying. And that's the phone overcompensating. And the one thing that the iPhone won't do is allow you to adjust white balance with their native camera app. So when that happens, I will go over to I've got one called Camera Plus, which is camera and just the little plus sign, not the word plus, just the little plus sign. Um, that one allows me to set the white balance and you it won't call it white balance. You'll see you'll see a setting that will probably just be WB. And that, but that means you can adjust how warm or how cool the photo is to get it back to a more neutral. That's a great tip. Balance. I didn't realize that. I usually bring everything yeah. into Photoshop and white balance it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can. You, I, 
often will have to white balance stuff in in Photoshop. But if you haven't got Photoshop, then right. um, yep. yeah, yep. It, using a third party camera app kind of helps that. Yep. And I noticed one more quick question. Um, I um, the the newer cat the newer phones. It was about how do you need a, a brand new phone like the for the iPhone 14, um, which has got obviously three lenses now, and a lot of these new phones have got multiple lenses. Uh, no, I don't think you do. I started using my phone to do the majority of my photography back when I had. Um, I, I I have to say I am an Apple girl. Um, I had um, an iPhone six, and years ago I was the editor of a magazine a print magazine called making jewelry for a long time and I even do I used that phone to you to photograph my step by steps that got printed in the magazine and were perfectly oh. good photos yeah so you don't need a really new phone just start out with whatever you've got or whatever you can afford but you do need what I just said your what did you call it? Your blue tape and your light yes. and your aluminum foil. Those yes. are the things rate, that you really do the need. Kitchen, rate yeah. the garage, yeah. the it's, painter's tape. <laughs> it's totally true and worth giving it a try. And try and experiment and you'll learn. And um and come back and watch this recording and you'll when you go, what did Sean say again? So it'll be right <laughs> here. So you guys, thank you so much. What a fun time. Everyone's saying thank you, right? You learned a lot. I know. Uh, don't forget you get the coupon code tools. 2022, um, 2022, 25% off all your craft cast classes. There's amazing stuff coming up. There's amazing video tutorials on there. You'll also get the um, handout uh, for tonight's class, tonight's presentation that has all of the links and resources and Jeff's information on the glasses. It's all in there. Any questions at all, just email us at support at craftcast.com. We love talking to everyone and answering their questions. So I just want to thank Sean, Heidi, Max, Jeff, Pam, Cindy, and Miss Barbara. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. It's so much fun to hang with everyone. Uh, so thank you all for coming on. I look forward to, uh, to seeing you all again. We will bring back the fun at one sometime in the near, near future. So thank you everyone for coming on and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you everyone for writing in. Bye-bye everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye guys.